Ina alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasul Allah. I apologize for the delay. Um, I don't know, it was a problem with Zoom uh, broadcasting, but alhamdulillah, we worked it out. Welcome to another day here at uh, Sunnah Followers. This is our Hadith class. Sister Laili, can you hear me? Sister Laili, type yes. That way you know if it's live because uh, Zoom's got uh, Facebook and Zoom are not coexisting correctly. Let me know if you, if you hear me. Okay. I mean, the Fresno's on there. Okay, good. This is live. I don't do no pre recordings. <laughs> no, I don't do pre recordings. Okay. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. We're going to go ahead and get started on the hadiths, and we are continuing with the hadiths from Riyadh Salihin. And today we go into the book of dress. These are all hadiths addressing uh, what we can, I guess, and cannot wear as Muslims. We're getting ready to find out. Let's go ahead and, uh, since we were so. Um, late getting started. Let's go ahead and just put these hadiths up on the screen. Let me make it sort of fit the screen. Okay, and we'll start off with the first set of hadiths here. These are hadiths addressing the excellence of wearing white clothing. And guess what? The permissibility of wearing red and green and yellow and black and the permissibility of wearing clothing that's made from cotton and linen and silk for women, but no silk for men. And again, Allah says in the Quran and in the interpretation, the meaning, O oh, children of Adam, we have bestowed raiment upon you to cover yourselves and as an adornment and the raiment of righteousness, that is better. When Allah is speaking about raiment, he's talking about clothing. We have bestowed clothing upon you. Clothing serves two purposes. Clothing serves the purpose of covering our private parts, and it also serves the purpose of adorning us or beautifying us. Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, Allah has made for you garments to protect yourself from the heat and the cold and also coats of mail to protect you from your mutual violence. So again, clothing serves the purpose of protecting us from the elements and even when we fight. And also clothing serves the purpose of covering our private parts and beautifying us. Now let's look at the hadiths addressing these verses. Ibn Abbas tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, put on your white clothing because they are the best and use white to shroud your deceased in them. So again, you know, most Muslims know the virtues of wearing white. Why do we like to wear white? Because the Prophet loved to wear white. White is pure. White represents uh, cleanliness and spiritualness. And even when we die, we know oh, if we can, we try to bury our deceased in the color of white. Also in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, wear white clothing because they are pure and they are closest to modesty and also shroud the dead in it. So again, there's the, the hadith that gives the evidence to what I just told you. You know, white clothing is pure, it's modest, and we bury our dead in it. What about wearing red? As you guys can see today, I am dressed elegantly in red. Fast track fashions, take a screenshot, Sister Jamila Pasha, a lot of Muslims will tell you that it's haram to wear red, that red is too attractive uh, for a woman. Well, first of all, we have to remember as Muslims that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. What's beautiful to you may not be beautiful to me. I like the color red. I mean, a Fresno may not like it at all. 
So again, we have to learn to keep our personal likes and dislikes out of Islam because everything is lawful unless Allah says otherwise. And for those men out there who like to beat down women mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, fear a law. And when you tell a woman it's something's haram for her to wear, bring the evidence. And if you can't bring the evidence, sit down and shut up and learn the religion, okay? Because there's nothing in Islam that forbids a woman from wearing red. There's nothing in Islam that forbids a woman from wear wearing any color of the rainbow. But I can tell you what you can't wear as a brother. So don't go there. And I don't have, I won't have to go there too. Okay. All right. But let's look to see what the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about red. One of the companions tells us that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was of medium height. And I saw him one day wearing a red cloak. And I have never seen anything more beautiful than that. So even our prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore red. So that shows that the color red did exist. So if the color red were haram for a woman or a man to wear, then the prophet would have said so. So don't use the excuse that red didn't exist. Red did exist. So if it's haram to wear red, then you should be able to provide your proof. If you can't, that means that it's lawful and you need to sit down and learn to accept the concessions of a law. Let's look at the next hadith. Another companion tells us, I saw the prophet by El Ufta, the valley in Mecca. He was in a red tent made from tan skin. Bilal brought him water to make wudu with. Then the prophet came out of the tent wearing a red cloak. And I can still remember looking at the whiteness of his, his, uh, his, his, his shanks. So he made wudu and Bilal pronounced the call for prayer. And I followed the movement of Bilal's face to the right and to the left when he recited, come to prayer, come to success. Then a spear was placed as a sutra in front of the prophet who then stepped forward and led the prayer the donkeys and the dogs passed in front of him beyond the spear and no one stopped them from doing so. You learn so much from this hadith. First of all, you learn the permissibility of wearing the color red again. Not only that, you learn the permissibility of having red, red furniture or red carpet or red curtains because the tent that the prophet stayed in was made out of red. And also you learn from this wonderful hadith that whenever you are praying in the open, meaning that you're praying out in the desert or praying in the woods or praying outside of a, a, a home that has walls, okay, or whatever, then you should use a sutra. It's best to use a sutra when you are praying outside in the open. So that way, whatever walks in front, the, the animals and the people can walk in front of you as long as they don't come between you and the sutra. Okay, so that hadith is a wonderful hadith because you learn all those things. And again, so at, say, for example, you're going to pray outside. You want to put a sutra in front of you so that the people can walk in front of you and not worry about that. They can walk in front of the spear of the sutra. They just can't come between you and the sutra. A lot of Muslims don't understand that. When I went to make Hajj, there was a big confusion over that. The men were so upset because the women had to walk to join in the lines. First of all, when you're praying, the Imam's sutra is your sutra. Whatever the imam has as a sutra, that's a sutra for everyone praying behind him. So the people can walk in front of that. Okay? And if you're praying by yourself, if you put a sutra in front of you, I can walk in front of it. See, this is the front. I can walk in front of my hand, but what I can't do is walk behind it, which is between me and it. So I can walk in front of the sutra. 
but I can't walk behind the sutra. And that's what you learn from that hadith. And I hope that's clear because I get a lot of questions about that from Muslims all over the world. Okay. Also, what about the color green? Well, another companion tells us that he saw the prophet wearing two green garments. Again, who are the people who lie and say that the prophet was shabby? Hello, does this sound like a shabby poor man? Hello, a trifling man? Our prophet Muhammad, I tell you all the time, he chose to live a life of simplicity. It wasn't that he was poor. He chose to be simplicit. He chose to only have enough to get him through the day. But he was not a shabby man. He was not a trifling man. He was not a, a, a rugged looking man. He wore red garments. As you can see, he had green garments. He had white garments. He chose to live a life of simplicity. Just because I live a life of simplicity doesn't mean that I'm shabby. Hello, look up the meaning of the word shabby. And none, not one, not one of the prophet's wives were shabby. They wore red like I have on. They had red. In fact, Aisha was married in a red dress. They had red hijabs. They had white hijabs, blue hijabs, yellow hijabs, green hijabs. The prophet's wives were like any other woman. They liked to look good. They wore makeup. They loved their coho. They used to wear the, 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 uh, the flowers and mash them for their cheeks to give color to their cheeks. And their lips, lipstick ain't new. They wore lipstick then too. Just like they polished their nails back then too, painted them. So this is nothing new. Women love to beautify themselves. Allah commands us to beautify ourselves. And if it were haram, the prophet would have said, you women need to be ugly. The prophet didn't have any ugly wife. All his wives were extremely beautiful. They were all drop dead gorgeous. Every single one. None of them were shabby. Look up the meaning of the word shabby in the English dictionary, people. Okay. All right. So here we can see our prophet was not a shabby man. Not only did he wear red, he had a green outfit too. Let's look at the next hadith. One of the companions says the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Mecca on the day of the conquest wearing a black turban. He always wore turbans. He loved to wear turbans. And here you can see he wore a black one. Another had companion says, it's as if I can see the prophet right now wearing his black turban and both ends of it fell over his shoulders. Subhanallah, Allah, that's how the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dressed. And also another companion says, when after the conquest of Mecca, he gave a speech, a kutbah, and he had his black turban on. So again, our prophet was not shabby in his appearance. He took pride in his appearance, just as he took pride in, in how he smelled. He made sure his body was clean, that he had no odor about himself, nor his breath, or any of that. And also, Aisha, the wife of the prophet, tells us that the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was shrouded in three white Yemeni cotton garments, among which was neither a gown nor a turban. So again, when we shroud our deceased, a man, it consists of three simple pieces of cloth and there is no turban needed, no shirt needed, okay? No ezar, just shroud the body in white sheets. Also in another hadith, Aisha tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went outside the home wearing a black blanket made of camel or sheep's black hair. And it had patterns of camel bags upon it. So again, does that sound like a shabby man? He had a blanket that had pictures of, of camel bags on it. He wore designs in other words. 
The prophet didn't have a problem wearing a design. So these Muslims out here who want to tell you to be ugly and shabby in your appearance, that you can't look nice, that being beautiful or attractive is a sin, tell them to fear Allah. And maybe if they stop that, Allah will take away the corona and other sicknesses, which he ain't going to do. Because unfortunately, we're going to get worse and worse and worse in our practice and understanding of Islam. We're going to deviate more and more and more away from the true Islam. So again, those are wonderful, wonderful hadiths uh, speaking about the excellence of basically wearing colors, wearing colors. I don't know where these Muslims today get this misunderstanding. There's a lot of Muslims that think that the prophet's wives wore black. They never wore black. You're not going to find any hadith uh, where any of the prophet's wives wore black except when someone died. The only time that the Muslim women wore black was when someone died. They wore colors like I'm wearing. Supana Allah, when Uthman and the prophet's daughter migrated to Ethiopia after the Muslims had migrated to, uh, the, the afterwards, the Muslims had migrated to Medina and the prophet worried about her, his, his daughter. And one of the companions said, oh prophet, I just came back from Ethiopia, you know, and I saw uh, your so daughter and, and your son-in-law. And he said, you seen my daughter? How was she? He said, she seemed fine. She had on a beautiful red, red jilbab and she was riding on top of a pony and Uthman was leading the, the pony. So, you know, the women love red. Red has always been a beautiful color for people. It represents happiness. And the prophet was so happy to hear that his daughter, you know, Rukaya, I think it was, you know, was happy. That's why he married his daughters to Uthman because Uthman was rich. He was a multimillionaire. His wives lived a good life like him. They had clothing and, and food and jewelry and money and, and ponies and camels and, and whatever they wanted. They were not shabby people. The prophet was not a shabby man. His children were not shabby children. His wives were not shabby women. And by the way, the companions themselves were not shabby people. It's only you Muslims today who are not only shabby in your looks, but shabby in your thinking. Hello, get the understanding of the companions. And then you'll do away with all that shabbiness. Okay. All right. We'll stop right here for today. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them on the screen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Also, for those of you on Facebook, I know this is a Friday. A lot of people are up all night on Friday or bored or just want to have something do, to do. You want to kick it, you know, with someone and there's no one to kick it with. You know, join us here in the Zoom room. Kick it with your Muslim women and, and Muslim women and men from around the world. We have Muslims here. There's what, 22 people in the Zoom room? They've been playing games most of the day, playing the Kahoot. You know, you guys know what the Kahoot game is. It's very fun. While they're playing the Kahoot game, I've been uh, uploading lectures and videos me and Sister May figuring out how to do the Sunnah Followers magazine. A lot of you have been asking about the Sunnah Followers magazine. Inshallah, we'll be reviving it. Uh, me and Faiza and May are trying to figure it out now. In fact, what I'm getting ready to do is spend the rest of my evening going into my AtliNet server, uploading the magazine so I can put them on the Wix server that we have now. So again, you know, if you want someone to talk with, you know, to talk about Islam with, share your life experience with, or if you want to ask me questions or whatnot, I can even get Dramali in here if you want to hear from Dramali. Join us here in the Zoom room. We'll be here all night, okay? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha ila anta staktiruka wa atubu